And this lecture is part of an online commutative course and will be about flat modules. Um, we just recall the definition. So the definition says that M is flat if naught goes to A goes to B being exact implies that naught goes to M tensor A goes to M tensor B exact. In other words, tensioning with a flat module preserves injectiveness. Um, and we also seen earlier that M is flat is equivalent to the localization MP being flat over RP for all primes in the spectrum of the ring R. It could also take all maximal elements in the spectrum. In particular, we see that stalkwise locally free. Um, so we discussed the stalkwise locally free modules last lecture, and we see that these are all flat because the stalks are free. Obviously implies that they are flat. So um, since all the stalks are flat, the module is flat. So, so um, to summarize, we've shown that free modules are stably free, and these are locally free, and these are projective, and projective ones are stalkwise free, and stalkwise free are flat. And out of all these conditions, it's probably flatness that's the most useful. Um, this is because, first of all, it's easy to check that a module is flat because you have, just have to check it's flat at each prime, and we'll see um, a bit about how to do this. Um, so that the, the other major advantage is there are huge numbers of examples of flat modules, whereas if you're talking about, say, projective modules or stably free modules, they're actually much rarer. Um, so not only all these projective and locally free and so on modules are flat, but also um, we have some more examples. Um, any localization um, RP at a prime or at any multiplicative subset is flat. And localizations of a ring are in general not projective or free or whatever. So um, this shows why we're interested in flat modules. There are plenty of flat modules which don't satisfy any of the, the, the stronger conditions. And um, we should also um, point out that over, for schemes, um, the analog for modules is sheaves and projective sheaves are pretty rare, um, at least if you're working with non-affine schemes, whereas flat sheaves are common. So for rings, um, flat modules are somewhat more common than for projective modules. But when you start doing algebraic geometry and doing schemes, projective scheme sheaves are almost non-existent and, and flat sheaves become even more important. Uh, needless to say, free sheaves and um, stably free sheaves and so on are also quite rare. Um, so and we should also give a, just remind um, a, a few examples of modules that are not flat. So the standard example of a module that's not flat is the, is the module Z over 2Z over the ring R is the integer. So this is not flat as we've seen earlier several times. Um, you can also ask, are submodules or quotients of flat modules flat? And the answer is they're usually not. So here we have the exact sequence. And here this, th these are flat. And this is not flat. So quotients of flat modules need not be flat in general. Um, you can also ask, are submodules of flat modules flat? Um, and 
Again, the answer is no in general. For instance, we could take the ideal generated by X and Y, and this is an ideal of the polynomial ring in two variables, and the quotient is just K. And here, this module is flat because it's free, and this is not flat. It would be actually easier to check this is not flat in a few lectures time when we've done the basics of homological algebra, so I, I won't bother proving this is not flat yet, although it's not difficult to check. Um, here you see this, this module here isn't flat, um, and you might ask if you've got a flat module mapping onto a flat module, is the kernel flat? And the answer is yes. Um, in general, if we've got a sequence naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught, which is exact, then B and C flat implies A is flat, A and C is flat, implies B is flat, and um, A and B being flat do not imply C is flat. So you've got to be a little bit careful. And again, these two facts here are very easy to prove using homological algebra, so I'll, I'll postpone the proof of them. Um, one of the key things that makes flat modules um, really useful, apart from the fact they're rather common, is that flat modules over local rings behave really nicely, at least if they're finitely presented. So here we have the sort of main theorem. Suppose M is a finitely presented module over a local ring R. So then the following are equivalent. Um, first of all, M is free. Secondly, M is projective. And thirdly, M is flat. And fourthly, um, um, naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to M, goes to naught exact, implies um, naught goes to A over M, goes to B over M is exact. When we've done homological algebra, we will see that this condition here um, is in fact equivalent to saying that Tor of M is R over M equals zero. But as we haven't actually defined the torsion groups yet, we're using this sort of ad hoc definition for what Tor means. Um, so, um, so, uh, we could also add conditions about being locally free or stalkwise locally free, but you've probably had enough of these. Um, now, these implications are very easy. This implication will be very easy when we've done homological algebra, so we'll postpone it for a bit. So the main problem is to show that that condition four implies condition one. And by the way, before going on, I'd, I'd better remark that um, I've said finitely presented here, and you may think that means that finitely generated isn't, isn't good enough. In fact, finitely generated is enough, but the proof is somewhat more complicated, so I'm only going to give the proof for finitely presented modules because I don't really care all that much about non-Notarian rings. Um, so, so let's show that this funny condition here implies that M is free. Um, and what we do is we choose a homomorphism from R to the N to M, which is an isomorphism from R over M to the N to M over M, M to the N. So, so M over the quotient out by the maximum ideal is a finite dimensional vector space over the field because M is finitely generated. So we can just take an isomorphism from this finitely generated vector space to us and lift it to a homomorphism like that. And we want to show 
this is an isomorphism. And we will show it is an isomorphism by using Nakayama's lemma over and over again. Um, first check it's on to, let's call this F. So we first check F is on to. Well, now what we do is we put, um, we've got R to the N goes to M goes to N goes to zero. So N is the quotient of M by the image of R to the N. And then first of all, N is finitely generated because M is. And secondly, you can see that this condition here implies that N is equal to M times N. So that, 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 that comes from this condition here. And now you know that these two conditions are exactly what you need for Nakayama's lemma. So Nakayama, this implies that N is equal to zero. So F is on two. Um, so let's look at what we've got so far. So we have R to the N maps onto M and it's got a kernel. And this kernel K is finitely generated. So let's make it injective. And it's finitely generated as M is finitely presented. Uh, it's not very difficult to check that if M is finitely presented, then the any kernel from a free module of finite rank onto M has, has finite kernel. Um, so now we tensor with R over M. And this is where um, we use this funny condition. Condition number four says that if we've got an exact sequence and we tensor it, with, um, mapping onto M and we tensor it with A over M, with R over M, then the result is exact. So um, this means that um, naught goes to K over M, K goes to R over M to the N is exact. So um, um, th 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 this, this is exact because of this condition, tor one R over M, M is equal to zero. That's where we use the condition. Um, so um, K over M K is actually equal to naught because um, this maps to M over M times M goes to zero. And we know that this is an isomorphism. So if this is an isomorphism and this is exact, it means this is equal to zero. And we know K is finitely generated as we said so up there. So now we again notice that Nakayama's lemma applies. So this implies that K is equal to zero. And if K is equal to zero, this means that R to the N is isomorphic to M. So M is free, which is what we wanted to prove. Um, so um, let's use this to discuss finitely presented modules over any ring. Um, so here we have, a, I guess this is a corollary. If M is a finitely presented module over any ring R, so we're, no, no, we're, we're, we're now no longer restricting to local rings then the following are equivalent. Um, first of all, um, um, M is projective. Um, I guess we could also have um, it's stalkwise free. And it could be flat. And I guess I got the conditions so let's just have locally free up there. So all these conditions are equivalent 
And again, zero implies one implies two implies three, we've sort of done earlier. Um, and three implies, um, three implies two follows from the lemma we've just proved. We've seen that um, 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 stalkwise flat, which is the same as flat, implies stalkwise free, because since M is finitely presented um, and the stalks are flat over local rings, it means they're free over local rings. So three implies two finitely presented modules and two implies zero. Um, uh, well, I guess we actually needed two implies one we did earlier. And I've got a feeling I forgot to show that for finitely presented modules, projective implies locally free, but um, whatever, we don't really use, make much use of locally free modules. Um, and the, these modules are particularly important because they sort of are the analog over rings of vector bundles. Um, so, um, uh, so that's enough for the moment about free modules. The next lecture will be rather a, a, what will be about torsion free modules, and it'll be rather short because torsion free modules are not really all that important. <laughs>